uh, uh, computer, stop, leave all tabs. Now playing Rob Liefeld dabs. No! <laughs> uh, I am not personally a foot fetishist. I'm just curious. Not about feet. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that feet are the most common fetish on the internet. Why, right? Well, in my research, I've come across some connections between the psychology of foot fetishes and the superpowers of Deadpool. So, allow me to fansplain. Deadpool's main superpower is his healing factor. But in real life, if somebody loses a limb, it's pretty common for people to experience phantom limbs. The really vivid feeling that the, the missing hand is still there, but it can be painful because it'll feel like the hand is paralyzed or clenched and uh, just excruciating pain. And Freudians, they would say, oh, the, the person is in denial about the loss of their limb. And so they're projecting this phantom. But I don't really buy that. I think Freud and Carl Jung and all those psychoanalyst guys, I, I, they're about as scientifically rigorous as astrologers or, or Aesop's fables. So what is really going on with phantom limbs and what does it have to do with Deadpool and, and foot fetishes? Well, for a long time, scientists thought that the problem was in the damaged nerve endings in the amputations. And so patients would beg doctors to amputate a little higher, which I think totally debunks the whole Freudian idea about denial. But it never really got any better. Sometimes it got worse. Do you know how in school you learn about the five senses? Well, you have other senses. You have uh, proprioception. Sometimes it's called kinesthesis. And it's basically the sense of, you know, where your body is in space. And in really rare cases, people lose their proprioception. And then, you know, if the lights go out or their eyes are closed, they can't move because they need to use their, you know, the visual feedback to just like look at their hands to make them move the way they want. Weird. But what this implies is that there's some sort of mental map of your body. Now, when Deadpool regrows a limb, it's probably like, I don't know, it, it, if that were real, it would be like how a salamander like regrows a tail, right? It would be genetic. But in real life, we really do have some mental image of what the rest of the body looks like. And the way that we know this stuff, uh, basically enough neurosurgeons convinced enough patients to let them just kind of poke around in there. It's basically like, hey, look, we're, uh, we're gonna crack open your skull and go in there and try to get that tumor or whatever. Um, but what would you say about staying awake through the whole thing? The surgeon will introduce a small electric current into the patient's brain. The patient must be wow. conscious to report the results of the doctor's probing. She feels little or no pain, for the brain has no pain receptors of its own. The patient may feel a tingling sensation somewhere else on her body instead. By electrically stimulating the brains of thousands of patients, they have been able to create a generalized map of the cortex. If they poke one spot, the patient might say, ooh, I, I felt that on my ear, or another spot, I felt that on my lips. The more nerve endings, the more sensitive your body part is, like your lips or your fingers, that's gonna be represented with a larger area in this mental map. And maybe your back is like a, a small area. And so they called this map the cortical homunculus. Cortical as in your cerebral cortex, homunculus is Latin for little man. And if you stretched it out, it would look sort of like this. So that is the location of the phantom limb. It's not in the severed nerve endings, it's in the homunculus. And in the absence of feedback from the missing limb, the brain kind of gets confused and thinks, what is something's wrong? Pain, pain. So neuroscientist and leather lover, V.S. Ramachandran, he had some patients with phantom limbs, but they said some weird stuff like, yeah, I have a phantom, but it's uh, shorter than the other limb. How can an imaginary limb be shorter? Or they would say things like, uh, yeah, you know, I don't actually feel the missing arm anymore. But the problem is I still have my phantom fingers dangling from the shoulder. What's going on? So Ramakandran started thinking about Hebb's law, which says that neurons that fire together wire together. And he also started thinking about the plasticity of the brain, the way that it can kind of rewire itself. And he realized that what was happening was that those sort of orphaned neurons in the homunculus that represented the fingers were casting around for connections and flailing and linking up with the parts in the homunculus that represent the shoulder. And then Ramakandran started thinking, well, 
what else about the homunculus might have to do with this adjacency firing together thing? And he noticed that the part that represents feet and toes is right on top of the part for genitalia. So in all my research, this is the most persuasive hypothesis for why it is that some people fetishize feet. They experience a sexual connection between feet and genitalia. So obviously, if I stop the video here, you might say, all right, the whole Deadpool connection to all of that was a bit tenuous, and I would agree, so let's keep going. Because we kind of left unresolved the issue of the, the pain of people that experience phantom limbs, and Ramakandran wanted to fix that too. And he came up with an idea that I, I just, there's the only thing I can compare it to is Deadpool's other superpower, his meta-awareness. Regeneration powers, activate! That's not something you say. Zip it, Cable! Deadpool knows that he's a comic book character. He knows when he's in a movie, and he'll comment on it. I mean, what freak show comic book artist came up with that little chestnut? Probably a guy who can't draw feet! The backstory of that joke is that Deadpool's creator, Rob Liefeld, he was always looking for ways to avoid having to draw feet, and uh, people still make fun of him about it, and he'll like joke about it on Twitter, and, and nowadays Deadpool comics will sometimes do these like self-parodying jokes about hidden feet, and it's just another way that Deadpool, as a character, uh, interacts with his own nature as a, a narrative construct. And so back to Ramakandran, he wants to help these people who are experiencing the pain associated with phantom limbs. And so he built a box with a mirror. And let's say my left arm is missing. Uh, I would put my right arm in and I would position it so that it, it matches my mental idea of what my phantom limb is doing. If it's clenched, clench the right arm. And then Ramakandran says, okay, now, together, release. And it works. First time I got in here and I've done this and it was just like, it relieved the phantom pain, unclenched it. You know, it was just, oh, so intriguing, you know. Amazing, and it worked for many, many people. It's been replicated a bunch of times, crazy. So let's think about this. These patients, they're not dumb. Like they know that that reflection is not really their phantom limb, but they're using the mirror as a tool uh, to sort of override uh, representation in their brain with visual input. They're using the mirror to break their own fourth wall because like Deadpool, all of us are semi-self-aware narrative constructs. Deadpool is on paper or pixels, but we're written in neurons. And if you really want to get meta about it, isn't that the entire point of fiction? To hold up a mirror to whatever is, you know, tangled and tortured inside of us so that we can relieve our pain. Also fart jokes, nuts to the face, all that stuff. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. If you like this video, I've got a bunch more, uh, all about comics in context. Some of them are about neuroscience, some of them are about other issues. So go ahead and subscribe to me.